So maybe what I first have to do is to um, maybe summarize a little bit what we did the uh, last time because it was uh, already two days ago. So, so um, I would like to recall you that, uh, of course, the general uh, uh, setting for this um, work is to understand the statistical dynamics of uh, some R sphere systems. And so what we have seen in the first lecture is that uh, you have this, um, say, average behavior which is given by the uh, uh, Boltzmann equation. Okay, so this means that actually if you look at the empirical measure of uh, your system, which is something like this, then uh, say almost surely it will converge to some f. And this f is a solution, so maybe I should uh, write at least once this Boltzmann equation, which is dtf plus v grad x f. So of course, uh, f is a function of uh, t, x, and v. Okay, so this is the part which uh, just tells you that you have transport. And then you have another part which tells you that you have collision in your system, so it's a collision operator like this, which is quadratic because it is supposed to um, to model this uh, quadratic interaction between uh, art spheres. And so uh, I'm not sure that it's really interesting to write it in a uh, more precise way, but maybe it's in it. I should do it at least once. So of course, t and x here, they are just uh, parameters because uh, all this collision in the limit when the size of the particles is zero are just uh, pointwise. Okay, and so you have something like this, which tells you that somehow you will uh, have new particles of velocity v just by collision of two particles of velocity v prime and v prime one. Okay, and you have a, a loss term, which tells you that you will have particles of velocity v which will disappear just by collision with uh, particles of velocity v one. And then for art spheres, uh, the, statist say the, the statistical rate of this collision is given by uh, this, um, so I think I called this omega last time. Okay, so what is important here is that it's uh, something which is really uh, pointwise in T and X, and you see that only the velocity R, and you have kind of jump process in V, uh, and this V prime and V prime one, they are given in terms of V, V one, and omega, just uh, with this relation here, that uh, you have that, you have V and V one on a sphere like this, then you will have v prime and v prime one on the same sphere, and then uh, omega is the angle of deflection. Okay, so this is the average motion. So if you look at uh, uh, this uh, system of particles in average, that this this is what you observe. Okay, and so in particular, if you look at the correlation between um, between uh, two particles, what you expect at uh, leading order is that uh, uh, it will be given by this. Uh, product here, okay? And more generally, if you look at, say, uh, the correlation of uh, P particles, X1, V1, XP, VP, okay? So this, of course, depends on epsilon. If you look at this for a, a fixed system, a uh, fixed um, epsilon, sorry. And then, but you see that this guy, what you expect is that in the limit when epsilon tends to zero, then it should look like this f of t of x1 v1 times f of t of x2 v2 fp t x p v p. Okay, so at leading order, this is really what you obtain. So you have kind of chaos. Okay, so chaos here in this in this uh, framework means that you have independence between particles. Okay, so this this is what is called chaos in this uh, kinetic theory. Okay, okay. so that, that's what we did the first time. And then uh, last time we, we have seen that actually this, of course, is the first order approximation of this guy here, of this uh, uh, P uh, particle correlation function. But actually we are able to say much more about this. Okay, so what we can do is to uh, look at, at, say, an expansion of this guy uh, in powers of epsilon. So the first term will be this one, but then we have all these uh, cumulant uh, function, so what we have 
uh, done is to uh, say that actually this guy, so now I will just uh, uh, write capital ZP for all these variables here. You can expand with cumulant, so uh, with um, so this cumulant will go from n equal one to uh, p, and you have a sum over all the partition in uh, n parts of uh, this set of p, and then here you have the product for. Uh, so on all the parts of this, uh, so i equal 1 to n of this cumulant of order uh, so sigma i. So this, OK, something like this. OK, so you can just uh, uh, take this set here, uh, 1, 2, until p. OK, so this is a set with p elements. Then you can uh, partition these sets in n subsets. OK, and then you have. Uh, this product here on all clusters, okay? And the interest when you do that is that actually you know uh, the size of this guy here. So what we have proved last time, or essentially uh, say, okay, it's not, what not really a proof, it was just a, a, an idea of uh, how you can prove such a thing. So uh, the, 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 the good thing is now that you have that this guy here, say of size S, in L1, is much smaller because it is of the order of, so essentially you have a factor of s here, a constant to the s, so this constant here depends on time. And you have this factor uh, epsilon to the d minus 1 to the power uh, s minus 1. OK, so you see that it's really uh, Somehow uh, all these corrections are really so. The, the first term here is when this this partition here is just consists just of singletons. Okay, so you have all these singletons. Of course, the term here will be of the order of one because it's just one, one times one times one times one times one. Okay, but then you see that you have uh, refinements of this uh, approximation just by looking at this decomposition here, and each time that uh, you have a cluster, somehow you gain a power here of uh, a small. Uh, uh, Parameter, okay. So that that's uh, what we did last time, and actually we have even more of a precise thing about this cumulant because we are able to say that uh, say in the limit, so they are represented by a, a connected graph, but in the limit only the minimally connected graph survive. Huh? So I just maybe uh, recall you this picture. So here we have this uh, say the dynamics of all these particles here, which are uh, represented by trees. Okay, and so essentially what it tells you is that um, you have P trees like this. So this is one, two, and this would be P here. And that uh, in order that uh, you are, say, this cumulants here consists of all the um, pseudo trajectories, so all the graphs. So it, it can be represented by all the graphs such that uh, these trees are uh, connected either by a recollision or, or, or by an overlap. Okay, so connection here, either by a recollision or an overlap. Okay, and so each of this connect, each of these clustering constraints actually uh, give you one power of this epsilon to the d minus one. Okay, so that's exactly why you obtain this, uh, how you obtain this estimate here, and then you you get that. Um, that uh, if you have one loop in this uh, representation here, so here this is really uh, minimally connected, but for instance, imagine that you have another uh, clustering, so another connection like this, so this one will be really smaller. Okay, so you can just remove them, and so really you have a, a, a very nice representation of this guy in the limit. Okay? So now what I would like to do is to use this to, um, to characterize, so I, I tell, I'll tell you actually that uh, we can use this uh, kind of uh, information to answer uh, many different questions. And the first one, th this is the only one that I will try to explain on today, is uh, that you can try to characterize the fluctuations, okay? So what I said here is that this empirical measure is supposed to converge to, so is proved to converge to this density f here. And so there is something which is really natural, which is to say, okay, but now you can uh, try to see 
uh, what's the difference between these two quantities here and say rescale it in order to see something. Okay, so this is really uh, what is called a central limit theorem. Okay. Can I, can I interrupt for a minute? Uh, uh, so in this uh, theorem, you, you allow recollisions or, or you say they don't count, they don't, you do allow recollisions, right? Uh, to, uh, here I, I have to allow recollision, but you see it's really to, to for the cumulant of order S. So meaning that, uh, for instance, for the cumulant of order one, you have just one tree like this. And what I say is that I shouldn't have any uh, loop in the limit. Yes. So having no loop in the limit means that you have no recollision. So this means that, say, at the level of the, the say, here, so this is the law of large number, this, this, this part here. So, so at, the at the level of the law of large number, you don't have any recollision. You don't see any recollision. So you see recollision only if you are interested in, in, in looking at this higher order cumulant. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, of yeah, course, you, you need some to see some correlations. Yeah, but, but then you, you, won't, you have to loop too, or not? You don't have no, loop. no, uh, so uh, you, you can have it for fixed epsilon, you will have. But say in the limits, the only one we, we will survive are those for which you have no loop. Okay, no loop. So you have ju just this recollision, which are called external recollision, because this is reco really a recollision between two different trees, okay? But, but say if you have an internal uh, recollision like this, this one can be removed. Or if you have a, a second recollision like this, this one can be removed. Uh, so you can prove that uh, essentially you say the, the, the leading order is, uh, is this size here, and the other orders are uh, smaller by one power of epsilon. So not really, really smaller, but a little bit smaller. Actually, it's not even epsilon, it's epsilon log epsilon. Okay, that's not really important. Okay, so now if I, I, I'm interested in the central limit theorem, what I would like to understand is this, uh, this fluctuation field. Okay, so the fluctuation field, I will uh, define it just by assembling it ag against a test function. And so what I look at is something like this of say H. So it will be uh, the difference between this guy here, h of z i of t, okay, minus so mu here. So I should say that that actually here I I I told you that I fixed the number of particles, which is not exactly true because what we use <coughs> is this uh, uh, grand canonical setting, and grand canonical means that. Actually, you have uh, a law for this number of particles, which is essentially a Poisson law, okay? And so what you know is not the, the exact number of particles, but just the average number of particles, and the average number of particles is mu. Okay, so this is a typical number of particles. Of particles, and this is this guy, which is related to the, si the, the size here of uh, the particles. So what you know is that mu times epsilon d minus one is equal to one. Okay, so this is the Boltzmann uh, regime, the Boltzmann Graz re regime, so or, or low density regime. Okay, so this is low density or Boltzmann Graz. Okay, so this this is uh, say the just I test here the, the empirical measure against this function h. So now I will just remove this part here, which is the expectation. Okay. The expectation of of uh, of uh, this empirical measure is mu times uh, the the first cumulant here that I test against this function h. So h is a very nice function, say continuous, uh, maybe c infinity is not really important. So of course uh, this is supposed to be of the order of n. But what you would like to say is that now it's not. Uh, uh, the leading order, so it should be uh, really a fluctuation. And so what you expect is that this guy actually will be of the order of square root of n. Okay, so then you uh, renormalize by one over square root of mu. Okay, and so what you would like to prove is that this fluctuation field will converge to something and to uh, try to characterize the dynamics of this something. Okay, so, so the goal is to characterize a 
the dynamics of the fluctuation. So of course here it still depends on epsilon, and so what we would like to do is to uh, look at the limit of this guy when epsilon tends to zero. Okay, so as epsilon tends to zero. Okay, so there will be um, there will be uh, many different tests, but before I. I really uh, tell you how to say which kind of statement you can prove and, and how you can, can prove it. I would like to do some small, simple comp competition just to show you how all these quantities are related uh, to each other. Okay, so uh, typically what I will do to um, try to understand this fluctuation field is to um, do a kind of, of sampling. Okay, so I, I will first uh, try to look at uh, the product of this guy for different h. And actually the, the, the thing that we should do is also to uh, look at the product of this for different h and different t. Okay? So, but I, I will not really uh, go into more details for different times because essentially it's the same, but everything is more complicated. So for the moment I will essentially look at uh, this. So what I would like to understand is the expectation, okay, so what is called a moment, so the expectation <laughs> of a product from I equal 1 to uh, P, say, of uh, this guy here, T of HI. Okay, so this is what we call the moments of the fluctuation. Okay, so now uh, th there is one thing that you can do is to just uh, replace this guy here by the definition which is here and then expand everything. Okay, it's not uh, really... Uh, but you see that you have essentially two type of terms. Okay, so just exploiting the fact that this is a difference. Okay, so what you get is something like the expectation of... Um, so you have... Um, so let me, okay, I, I will uh, first introduce a partition. So, and this partition will tell you whether I, I use, uh, say, the first part here, which is uh, really uh, uh, related to the empirical measure or to the other part here. Okay, and so I have something like uh, um, uh, the sum over all possible uh, partition. over all parts, sorry. So I take just one part. Okay, so I will call A uh, part uh, with N elements. Okay, and so the in the first part I will take the, the first, um, and I will have the, the, okay, here the product for I in, in A of uh, the sum from G equal 1 to N of the H I of the G of P. Okay. And then, of course, if I have the product here, then I will have the product for I, which is not in A, of just integral of, say, F1 <coughs> times H I. So this guy depends on T times H1. Okay, something like this. So I just separate the, and of course there is a minus one uh, with the cardinal of here. Okay, so anyway, you see that here, what I have is something which is really, uh, so I can once again uh, expand this, and you see that I will have a, a sum of functions which are really uh, similar to this s epsilon p which is above. Okay, so the only thing, so it would be exactly this one, 
if you have no repetition, but of course you can have some repetition. Okay, so if you have repetition and you have this kind of um, uh, direct mass, and you have say, uh, so maybe I can write one of them. Okay, so if you have a sum here, so assume that uh, this a is just the the, the so so a will be uh, from one to n, say. Okay, so I try to look at this term here, and I assume that uh, a is just uh, con consists just of a2 until n, okay, and I try to compute the expectation of this guy. Of course, there is an expectation which is missing. Okay, the expectation I can put here, but of course, nothing else depends on the probability measure. Okay, so if I expand this, you see that I will have once again uh, uh, a partition in, uh, in uh, say now, S part, okay. So this product here of sum equal 1 to n of hi of zj of t. So I will have a partition, uh, say, s equal 1 to n, and a partition sigma psn. Okay, and so what I have is that I repeat uh, the, the same term here, which is the term which is uh, here. Uh, I will repeat it uh, so as, as many times as it appears in the bars, okay? So I have something like uh, uh, the product, okay, it's complicated to write, it's not really uh, funny, okay, of, um, of say, H, so I will write this h sigma i is just a product of uh, of all uh, h in uh, sigma i, okay? And so I have the integral of this guy against uh, f. Uh, so I have this h sigma i say of z one, h sigma one, h sigma p s sorry of z s, okay? So you see that. I have to uh, choose all this, this, all this guy, uh, and so I have mu to the s, okay? And then I have, I have to multiply this by f s of z1, z s. Okay, so you see that when s is equal, so the simplest case is when s is equal to one, okay? This means that actually all, this, all the arguments here are different. Okay, and so here I guess uh, I obtain the fn of z1, zn, and I just multiply here, but h1 of z1, h2 of z2, hf of zs. Okay, so this is one when all the, 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 the arguments here are different, but of course you can repeat some of them, and so this is more complicated. Okay, so but you see that now what is important is that uh, you can somehow um, uh, develop all these <laughs> fs now with the cumulant expansion, okay? And so this is really uh, what you have to do. So first of all, you do this, then you, uh, then you uh, replace uh, with this uh, fs that we have already computed, and then uh, you uh, third step, so first step you uh, expand like this, second step you expand like that, like that and then uh, replace each uh, fs, by uh, its cumulant expansion. <coughs> okay, so I will not do this computation because it's uh, complicated, but what I would like to uh, show you with, with this is uh, say uh, what the different uh, size are and what you obtain uh, in the end for this, uh, uh, for this moment. Okay, this is the only thing that I would like to, to show you right now. Okay, so I will uh, develop this. Okay, so here you see you have uh, this factor mu to the s. So something that I have uh, not written here is that of course I have to multiply this by, uh, so this here by mu to the minus p over two. Okay, so this is just, this just come from the definition here. So here I have uh, uh, something like this. And here I have a mu. Sorry? 
This n? Yeah. So this small, uh, this n is just uh, anything between, uh, so this is a sum actually over n, which goes from 1 to p. So I take any parts, okay, of uh, a, a part here, and I say that <coughs> in this part I, I take this, this term here, and the, in the complementary I take uh, the expectations here. And of course I have this mu here, which come from, uh, from, the, uh, from, from this w here. Okay, so in the n, what I get is something like a mu times, so here I have the cardinal of, uh, uh, of the, complement, the complement, and here you have minus p over 2. Okay? And so now you have to, to look at uh, the, all the thing, and so uh, there are many uh, important uh, remarks when you look at this. So the first one is that, uh, of course, there is a term. The, fir the first term that you are interested in are the terms where you have at least one occurrence of this F1. Okay? And what I say that this is a, a very, uh, uh, it's not a difficult computation. Of course, you have to sum over all these partitions, so it's a little like a mess. Okay? But then in the, in the end, this is just uh, the formula, uh, the binomial, binomial formula, which tells you that actually all the terms such that you have at least one occurrence of F F1, they will disappear. Okay? So in the end, when you compute all of this, Okay, you have no occurrence of F1. Okay, so you can just, uh, so you see that here you have, uh, you have uh, just because of this uh, minus one which comes here, you see that you have some cancellation, because of course you see that uh, the, the term with the F1, you can compute all the term with the F1 coming from here, and this complicated because of course you have to expand all these guys here, so there are a lot of, of term like this, but all these terms, because of this minus one here, you, you end up with a, a one minus one to some power, okay? And this is the, the, you know that it's zero, except if this power is zero, okay? So this is just uh, the binomial formula. Okay, so now you see that you have a sum over plenty of things, but uh, these, these are just, uh, okay, the sum, the, the, the typical term in this sum is just uh, a, a product of f sigma i of z sigma i, okay? And this is a sum, this is a product, uh, and you have a sum over an uh, old partition, and then of course you have a coefficient, but say you have this uh, partition here in, a, in a, uh, say, n part of p, okay? And then you have products like this. Okay, because this, this, these are just of the same form, okay? They are just a product of just here, you just have F1. Okay, so you have something like this, and of course each one is, is, uh, is uh, integrated uh, against this uh, H uh, sigma i, okay? Okay, so all the terms are like this, okay? Now you can count the, s the, 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 the size of this guy. Okay, and you see that if, if you have at least, if you have uh, at least one part here, so you have a cluster, so you have all these elements, okay, all, th all these uh, uh, P elements, so you know that, say, the partition cannot have uh, singletons, okay, so now you have uh, another partition without singletons, okay, so a partition like this of one, one P without singletons, and now what I say is that, you see that each time I have a big cluster, so a cluster of size more than two, then if you count uh, here, each time you have a cluster like this, what you gain is mu to the minus size of this guy minus one. Okay? And so if you count this, you see that if you have at least one big cluster here, you will find a term which is uh, small. Okay, so the only way you can get a term which is of the order of one is that the partition in the end is just a pair correlation. Okay, so in the end, so only pair correlation will survive. Okay, because here you see that somehow you gain, uh, you gain one additional power of mu, okay? Few one out actually, but uh, okay. So these are really the two important properties, 
And so what you end up with is that uh, this guy here essentially will be, uh, you can just look at per correlation, and then you can decouple everything. Okay, so this is really uh, what is important. So this tells you that actually in the end you end up with something which is Gaussian. Okay, so you have a Gaussian statistics. So these are the moments of a Gaussian statistics. Okay, so um, now I think I can uh, tell you what is the result for the, the characterization of uh, this fluctuation, and then I will uh, tell you a bit more on, on the proof. Yeah, sure, I have time. Okay, so the theorem. Maybe I should uh, tell you uh, what are the people involved in this um, in all this uh, work. So Thierry Bodino. And Serge Simonella and me. Okay, so you can uh, what you can prove is that uh, this uh, um, so uh, the fluctuation field converts. Uh, as epsilon, so either mu tends to infinity or epsilon tends to zero, but anyway, they are uh, related by this uh, Boltzmann uh, grass scaling, okay, uh, to the um, solution of the Orsteiner and Beck process. So, um, uh, so this process, uh, so the equation for this process is d zeta t is equal to, and uh, of course I will uh, detail all the term. You have uh, L of f of t. So this will be uh, the linearized Boltzmann operator that I will write soon. That you apply to uh, zeta t t plus a noise, so this is the noise. And so this noise is white both in T and X, and so it's white in T and X. And then uh, there is a covariance that you have to compute to take into account this uh, V variable, okay? So I will compute the covariance. Uh, can be computed explicitly. Okay, so this means that you have a very precise, uh, a very precise uh, characterization of the fluctuation. Okay, so but you you see that actually for this uh, characterization of of uh, the fluctuation. What we will use is very few information about this, this cumulants. What we will use is, first of all, that say, they are small, so we need somehow the bound, but we, we don't really need uh, uh, such a, a refined bound. Essentially, we can, okay, here it's very precise, but we, can, uh, we just need to see that uh, only the per uh, correlation survive, else it's not really important to know exactly the, the order of magnitude of all these uh, cumulants. And then we will see that we only need the, the, the precise limit of the second order cumulant. Okay, so at the level of the central limit CRM, only the second cumulant is important. The other one, you just need to, to know that they are sufficiently small in order that you can just neglect all these effects. Okay, but so you see that somehow uh, uh, this, all these techniques with uh, a very high order cumulants, they are somehow too refined just for the central limit CRM. So there is someone that, that's something that I will uh, not tell you uh, today, but actually we can do much better because what we can say, it's the next step, we can use all these cumulants, so all this very precise information to uh, get uh, some large deviation results, okay? Oh, but it's even more complicated, so I, I will not um, uh, tell you about that uh, today, but really it's important to see that actually with this, this, uh, this very precise description of, uh, of cumulants, you can have much more information about the system. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. 
to uh, a four times smaller than a lang four times. Thank you, that's really important. We are not able to go beyond this, um, uh, to go beyond this time. It's a covariance because of V, just in V. So I will, I will write the covariance anyway. So, so but uh, in T and X. Space time and, and V. Yeah. So what I would like to do in the rest of the time now is to give you just, of course, a, a very uh, brief sketch of the proof. Of course, there is uh, no way I can go into the details, but, but I think it's important just, say, first of all, to understand a little bit more this equation here, and then to uh, see what are the, the things that you have to check. So, and I would like to have a little bit of time just to talk about the covariance because it's important. And I will re really uh, say, as for the rest of these uh, talks, to try to um, just give you a uh, graphical representation of all these things, okay? Because this, I think it's easier to, to understand that uh, this uh, complicated equation. Okay, so, um, so first thing that uh, I would like to tell you is that what you need to prove such a theorem. So the first thing is that actually uh, uh, you have this moment method that tells you that actually you can recognize uh, this guy, so this process here because it's Gaussian, you can recognize it provided that you have this result on the moments that only you have only per correlations. Okay, so uh, the moment <laughs> method tells you that essentially this this uh, this process here is completely characterized, provided that you know uh, that you can uh, pass to the limit into all this uh, in all this uh, in all these moments. Okay, so what we need uh, is to uh, uh, characterize the limit. of all moments. So when I say all moments, it's not only the moments that I have written there, but also, also the moments where you have different types. Okay, so the, the sampling that you should have is something like this. So you have to look at the expectation of, of uh, the sum. So of, how do I call this? C, so the product, sorry, from i equal one to p. And so now you look at your uh, fluctuation field, okay? You test it on a function hi, but now you look at this at a time which is t theta i, okay? And now this theta i can be different, okay? Because you are not interested only at the correlation at one given time, but you really would like to uh, sample all the dynamics, so you need to sample all possible time, okay? So this is really important here that you uh, can have different times, sampling times. So you need this different times to get this theorem, or? Yeah, yeah. In order to prove this, you see it's really a, a result about the dynamics, and so I cannot say only something at, say, for a given time. I really uh, I need to sample all the trajectory, and so to sample this trajectory, I need to be able to look at all this time, okay? But say, the, 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 the expansion with cumulant that I have given for uh, just one time, you can do exactly the same. Say, instead of having p trees rooted at, uh, rooted at the same time, you will have p trees rooted at different time. But you can do exactly the same uh, procedure to know whether they are connected or not. Okay, so it's more complicated because of, because of the notation, and also something which is much more complicated. And you will see this in a minute when uh, I will talk about the covariance. Is that you see that here essentially what you have is that you can have. Say either you take all your particles, uh, so maybe it's, uh, it's, it was on, on here, no, okay. But uh, so somehow uh, the self-correlation are more complicated with different time here, okay? And I will 
show this in a minute, uh, that the self-correlation, so self-correlation at one time, this is just a direct mass, okay? You have the same particle and that's it. Okay, self-correlation at different times may be different because essentially if you are in the tree of, of the first particle here, any particle which is in the tree, you have a kind of self-correlation. Okay, so self-correlation are much more complicated at different time, but essentially, apart from this, uh, this is really the same kind of things. And what is important here is that really the fact that essentially uh, the, uh, what you obtain is that you have this pair correlation. Okay, so, so with only pair correlation in the limit. And actually, this is not completely uh, enough. Because you see that, once again, what you would like to sample is really a, d a, a, a continuous dynamics. And here, I have only uh, discrete time. Okay, so what I need, uh, in addition to this, is uh, some tightness with respect to time. Okay, so this is the second thing that you need, is uh, tightness with respect to time. So what, what it means? So it means that uh, you would like that if you look at two uh, very uh, close time, then of course your trajectory will not jump completely crazy, okay? So y what you look at is something like, you look at, say, C epsilon t. So I don't say anything about the norm here, because of, of course here you have to test, uh, say, against, uh, uh, say, suitable function, okay? So I don't say anything about the norm. It's not really important at this stage. So you look at this, and you look at the probability that uh, uh, this, that the soup for s minus t less than, del than say, uh, alpha, delta. So epsilon here is maybe not, uh, okay? And you look at the probability of this. And, and ne like you look at the limit as epsilon tends to zero of this. And then at the limit when delta tends to zero. And you will you would like this to be uh, zero. Okay, so this just tells you that in a very uniform way, uh, that's what is difficult actually. In a very uniform way, you cannot have very big jump of, of this process, okay? So this, this is really important because here you see that you have only discrete sampling in time, and so you, you need to be sure that there will not be any crazy uh, behavior for very small time. Okay, and so here maybe I can just tell you one point which is a little bit complicated. <laughs> so that, um, so the first thing is that you see that with these cumulants, this kind of LMFT norm is not something which is very natural. Okay, so what you would like to use is that you can, say, characterize other continuity with, with kind of integral norms, okay? So this is something which is uh, ca quite classical tool in analysis, okay, uh, with all these uh, Bezos spaces, for instance. Okay, so the first thing is that you have uh, uh, to characterize, so other continuity has to be characterized with integral norms in time. Okay, and the other thing is that, uh, um, so essentially what you will prove is, is an estimate on the, on the expectation of this guy to the power uh, four. Okay, so you prove something on the expectation and you have something like, so uh, a first term which is like T minus S, which is very good actually, if T, mi T minus S squared. So this one is very good actually. If you have this, it would be perfect. Th then you use this kind of kind of uh, relation between uh, these inequalities uh, between integral norms uh, and uh, elder continuity, and then you are done. So it's very good. But unfortunately, you have another term here, which is small because it's like one over mu times t minus s, and this just tells you that, of course, if you, you see that at the level of at for fixed epsilon, sometimes you have a jump. And once you have a jump, this is not small, okay? You, you have really something 
okay, this, this will happen with, uh, with uh, on a very short time, it's very uh, unprobable that you have a jump, but if you have one, then this, this norm is not small, okay? So here, this means that you have to do something else uh, for very, very uh, small time <laughs> interval, okay? So, um, and you have, to, you have to take care of, uh, say, kind of, okay, take care of small time intervals. And then you have to uh, go back really to uh, the, the dynamics, the individual dynamics. So, so here there is really something uh, uh, that has to be done and which is a little bit complicated. But I, I will not comment more about, about tightness. And so what I would like to come back on is, uh, is this uh, covariance here, okay? So th this is the global strategy of proof, okay? And so of course you see that once you have this, you are only, uh, everything is, is, is characterized by the, the, the pair correlation, so one pair correlation, and this is exactly what gives you the covariance. Okay, so now what you have to understand is really one pair correlation. So you have two particles now, maybe uh, with different time. Okay, so what you would like to understand is really uh, this kind of correlation between two particles at different times. So here you start from particle Z1 at time T1 and this particle Z2 at time T2. So a first way that you can be uh, correlated is exactly about doing uh, what we uh, did until here. So you have two trees, and at some point you have here either a col uh, recollision or an overlap. Okay, and so this, this will have a contribution to uh, uh, the second order cumulant, and this second order cumulant is really what uh, will be important here to characterize this recollision. Okay? But you see that, say, if you think about this, uh, this, uh, this sum that I, I have written at the very beginning, you see that, uh, that there was uh, this kind of uh, sum of H1 of Zi times sum of H2 of Zi. Okay? So uh, if you have equal times, then the only exception to uh, this kind of picture is the case when uh, when you have the same uh, zi in the two sums. Okay, so either you have something like h1, you, you, you have to look at something like this, f2 of z1, z2, okay, so, and this, this is represented by this kind of graph, okay, or you have something like h1 of z1, h1, h, h, oh, sorry, h2 of z1, and then you have just f1 of z1. Okay, so if you have equal times, that there is no other possibility when you expand uh, all this to look at the expectation of this guy, okay, you get a, a mu square times this, and then, then a mu times this. Okay, there is no other possibility. Then you expand this guy with the cumulant, okay, and so when you expand this guy with the cumulant, you see that you have a first term which is mu times h1 of z1, h2 of z2, f1, f1 of z1, f1 of z2 plus a second term which is uh, smaller, which is uh, mu square times h1 of z1, h2 of z2, and then f2 of z1, z2. And now this is the cumulant, and this guy is of the order of one over mu. Okay, so in the end, so this here, because it's, it's not in the correlation, it's really uh, the part which is the, the part which is factorized. Okay, and so if you look at the correlation, you have these two parts, so this guy here, and this guy here, and you see that they are of the same uh, order because here you have one occurrence of mu, it's here you have two, but actually this guy is of the order of one over mu. Okay, so if you start with one time, this is somehow uh, simple because you have only these two possibilities. Now if you start with two different times, it's different, okay? Because you see that here, this d2, of course, it can be equal to uh, z1, but it could be also equal to any of the guys which are here in the tree. Okay, if I just expand, I, I, I start with the dynamics here, just start my, my stuff as, as usual, 
And then I would like to know the correlation with this guy, but maybe the number of this guy here is one of the level which is already in the, in the tree here. Okay, so now the, the picture is a little bit more complicated because I have either this picture here, so the one with two different roots, or I have another picture, so what will replace this, this simple thing with a direct mass will be another picture, which is just a tree, which is like this. And then the Z2 is one of this guy. Okay, so now the root is Z1 at theta1. And now Z2 is one of uh, the descendant of the Z1. Okay, so once again, there is not this problem where, where you have just one time because uh, the only descendant at time t of z1 at time t is z1. Okay, but now it's more complicated. Okay, and so now you see that if you would like to characterize this, this uh, uh, covariance, you have the sum of this, say, all these graphs and all these graphs. Okay, so covariance is obtained by taking the sum over all graphs, say, of type uh, 2. So this will be a uh, type 2, okay, because you have two roots. And this will be type 1. And graph of type two, 1. So now I would like to relate this uh, to the, the equation. <coughs> so um, now if I, I try to write this, what can I say? You see that say in this graph now you, you know that in the limit only the, 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 the minimally connected graph will, re, will, will, uh, will uh, survive okay so this means that each time here you have a collision so here I have the only this, this tree which is a little bit complicated it's a little bit uh, sim simple representation but say the, the tree for uh, is something like this okay okay and so this means that actually only one particle in this tree will have this free collision here, okay? And all the other, they will have, so you, you see that they, they will go back without any re collision until time zero, okay? So this means that actually each, each of these particles that you add, okay, they will essentially what you can do is to patch the tree which comes from the Boltzmann dynamics, okay? Because this one, you know that how to represent it, the, the, this Boltzmann dynamic, you can represent it by a tree which has, say, which is like this. Okay, so this, this, this part here is just a representation of F1. Okay? So of course, if, if this particle is the same particle as here, which has the recollision, then you see that it's not complicated because you have just patched a lot of Boltzmann trees. So here you patch one Boltzmann tree, here another one, here another one, and that's fine. You see, it can be a little bit more complicated, but because this one, say the one we recollect here, is maybe not exactly this one, but maybe you have something like this. Okay, so just a kind of broken light like this. Okay, so this means that actually each time you have a collision, maybe you will just exchange a label. Okay. So here, this is really w what is important. So only the, 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 the yellow particle is important because the other one, they are just ruled by this Boltzmann dynamic, so you don't really care. So this will give you ex exactly this, uh, this linearized operator here. And so you see that the, 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 the way you can have this, so in particular here, the, the only possible uh, correlation is just by looking at this, this kind of broken line. And this broken line is exactly the linearized collision operator. Okay, so linearized collision operator. Oops. So you see that it depends on F, which is the solution here of the Boltzmann equation. The Boltzmann equation. 
And so uh, if you apply this operator to some uh, function g, the result is this, this thing. So you have f of, I will try to use the same notation as here. Yeah, I know it, v prime and v1, OK? So it, it will be uh, f, say, of v prime, g of v prime 1 plus f of v prime 1 g of v prime minus g of v f of v1 minus g of v1 f of v. And then the same uh, v minus v1 dot omega to omega in v1. Okay, so really you see that it's really the interaction, the quadratic interaction of your function g, which are you are really interested in, which describe this uh, yellow line here. And say, each time you have a collision here, it's a random collision, but with a, a density that you know, OK? You know the, the density of particles that can collide with you, because this it's given by this the solution of this Boltzmann equation. OK, so this, this is the first part. It's this, the, this linearized thing. It really comes from uh, this. this um, so here you see that only on you will see only this part, okay, in this first uh, uh, configuration here because you have no new particle, so there is no no recollision or nothing like this. Of course, the graph is connected because you just have one, and so now the correlation of th between these two points is 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 computed with this linearized operator. Now it's a bit bit more complicated here because you have uh, the same. So <coughs> each one of these particles will have this uh, yellow line, okay. And then you have this recollision here. Okay, and so recollision, it exactly corresponds to this uh, singular measure that the two particles have to be at the same point at the same time. Okay, so here you have this recollision operator, and this gives you actually the, the covariance. So I will uh, just give you the result because actually you have to expand everything uh, in order to, to find the covariance. So I just give you the result is that uh, if you look, at the expectation of, say, uh, xi uh, theta 1 h1, so this is zeta, zeta theta 2 h2, what you find is an integral of, OK, let me check. It's um, a little bit complicated, actually, because you have to. Um, you have to move all the, this h1 and this h2. You have to move them with the linearized operator. And then you have to write that uh, they, um, so maybe I have the formula here. <coughs> so it's, I'm not even sure that, yes, I have. So it will be uh, something like this. So you have 1 half of t of t x1 v1 f of I think T of, so I integrate over theta 1 and theta 2 and over x1 and x2. No, it's theta 1 and theta 2. And I integrate here. So I have, OK, it should be, so this is here that you see that it should be, uh, um, it's white in time and x, and x because you see that it's exactly the same here. And here you have v1 and v2. And then you have the delta h1 times delta h2. And delta h is just this, this quantity here. So delta h is just h of v prime 1 plus h of v prime 2 minus h of v1 minus h of v2. OK, so it's rather complicated. Thing, but you see that what is important here is that if you integrate in theta 1 and theta 2, you only find one time here, which means that the noise is, is white in time. It's white in x here because this is the same x, because it's really due to the fact that this recollision here, you see that you see only one time here. Okay? And so, really, uh, what you should have in, in mind is that you move this h1, okay, h1 is the, the test function here, you move it with this linearized operator. The h2 is the function here. You move it with a linearized operator. And then you end up with one random time here, which is this, uh, this t, which is a random time be between uh, 0 and, uh, and uh, say, the maximal time here. And here you have a recollision, meaning that, that, that uh, both particles are exactly at the same point at the same time. 
Okay, so I, I'm, I think I'm almost, uh, my time is uh, almost done. So I, I would like just to, to make a, a small comment in this, uh, in this regime. Um, so you see that uh, in the particular case, when F is an equilibrium, so now you look at the fluctuation around an equilibrium, so you start with initial data, which is just a Gibbs measure for the system. Okay, so start from this Gibbs measure, and you are looking at the fluctuation. So okay, of, of course, the solution here of the Boltzmann equation is just trivial. This is just the Maxwellian, and it will be the Maxwellian forever because this is the stationary solution. Okay, now if you look at this, at this fluctuation, you see that you still have a little bit of noise. You still have this uh, dissipation here. <laughs> and so there are many things which are interesting. So the first one is that, say, uh, the noise here in the close to equilibrium compensate exactly the dissipation which is due to this. Uh, so this is something which is well known by physicists as a, a dissipation fluctuation balance. Okay, so all the, the, the information that you lose in average essentially are encoded in this noise. But of course, it's, it's true only close to equilibrium, else you lose still something, and then you have to go to the other cumulants. Okay? And the other thing in close to the equilibrium is that actually we have, um, we have a method, which is close to method that people use in quantum physics, in, in for instance, in order to extend this time. Okay? So this, this is the only regime where we can go so close to equilibrium. We can really use the fact that you have this invariant measure to get some a priori bounds, which are much better. And then we can really improve this, okay, and get the, the linearized. So now the, 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 the thing is simpler somehow because the noise is just the thing which compensates uh, the, the dissipation. And so what is interesting is only to obtain this uh, linearized Boltzmann equation. And we can justify this on a very long time. Okay, so maybe not so long but uh, sufficiently long to see the relaxation towards equilibrium and even to see hydrodynamic regimes. Okay, so if you start really, really close to equilibrium, so really, really close to the Gibbs measure, what you can prove is that uh, essentially uh, you, have, you can characterize the temperature of the system and the temperature of the system will, be sat will satisfy the Fourier law, for instance, and uh, the, uh, the bulk velocity of the system will st satisfy the Stokes equation. Okay, so in this particular regime, so really, really close to equilibrium, then you can really improve this and then see more about the, the macroscopic dynamics of the system. But unfortunately, this is the only case where for the moment we are able to go beyond this uh, landfall time. Okay, I think it's really time to, to stop. I'm sorry because it was a bit more technical than the two others, but um, I think it's important to see what kind of things we can prove with this uh, kind of uh, missiles. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.